viewers, speakers and panelists, a very good afternoon from Luxembourg and a very warm welcome to a virtual conference by the European Court of Auditors on the future of statistics. It's a great pleasure to be your moderator for the next couple of hours or so. Now, together, we will explore the future of official statistics in achieving two very important things, independence and accountability against the backdrop of big data. Our program for today is very dense, so we're in for very fast-paced speeches, presentations and debates. With us, we have highly esteemed keynote speakers and panelists. They may not have a crystal ball on what statistics will bring in the future, but they are extremely well placed to make informed decisions and predictions about what the challenges the statistics will face in the future and the opportunities it will bring. But first and foremost, we will hear from our host, the European Court of Auditors President, Mr. Tony Murphy. Thank you very much, Damien. Good afternoon, everybody. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's online conference on the future of official statistics in achieving independence and accountability in the age of big data. This builds on our special report on the quality of official European statistics. Unfortunately, my colleague, Ildiko Gal-Peltz, who was the reporting member responsible for this report, is unable to participate due to short-term illness. But she sends greetings and hopes that you will find this conference both informative and engaging. In today's data-driven world, high-quality official statistics are crucial for governments, businesses, researchers and citizens to make evidence-based decisions. To maintain their quality and reliability, these statistics must be produced independently and with accountability. But we must also remember that the production of statistics is not an end in itself. They are a public good and must be generated first and foremost with users in mind. In an age of disinformation and serial crisis, it is paramount that official statistics must be high quality, meet users' needs and explore innovative ways of production. Reliable, quality and usable figures are of course essential to upkeep citizens' trust. And so is verification that the EU respects the rules and delivers value for their money. We at the European Court of Auditors operate daily with facts and figures in order to report independently on whether and how the EU achieves its objectives. As a regular user of our statistics in our work, and having recently published a number of relevant reports in this area, we wanted to bring together different voices in the industry. Today is an opportunity to explore the future of governance, independence and accountability in official statistics. In addition, we will also discuss the impact of technological advances such as big data on statistical production and development. In our special report on the quality of official European statistics, published in November 2022, we identified some weaknesses and issued recommendations. Our colleague, Mr. Kustelidis, will give a brief overview of our audit and recommendations. We are honoured to have such distinguished keynote speakers and panellists with us today. They will share their perspectives on the future of official statistics and statistical product development. We will hear from some of the best positioned institutions inside the EU as well as beyond their borders. Their invaluable expertise will allow us to go deep and wide on these topics. Indeed, we can call this a transatlantic debate. This conference provides an excellent opportunity to discuss the future of official statistics. Thank you for joining us today and I am sure that you will have a very interesting and constructive debate this afternoon. A warm words of introduction. Now for those who are somewhat less familiar with the ECA, the ECA is the external auditor of the EU and as such an independent guardian of the financial interests of the EU citizens. Now in other words, we are the EU's financial watchdog and as President alluded to, facts and figures are indeed our strongest currency and also our daily bread and butter. 
Now, this conference comes on the heels of an audit report we have issued on, on European statistics. It is, of course, available on the ECA website. However, we will now have an opportunity to hear directly about it from our senior auditor behind it, Mr. Athanasios Kostolidis. So, Mr. Kostolidis, or Thanos, as we know you in the house, great to have you here, first of all, uh, in the studio with us. And, in fact, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Damien. Good afternoon, everyone. It is my pleasure to be here today to present our special report on the quality of official European statistics. It is to William Edwards Deming, who helped rebuild the Japanese economy after the Second World War, that we owe the quote, without data, you are just another person with an opinion. Official statistics address the need for re reliable data on multiple aspects of our society, including demographics, health and energy, as well as key economic indicators, such as inflation and unemployment rates. Now, let us look at how official statistics can help us make better decisions. In the economy, official statistics are a key input for the monetary policy decisions taken by central banks, which in turn influence the interest rates people and businesses pay or get on their deposits. Here is also an example from Luxembourg, where the European Court of Auditors, or ECA, is based. The Prime Minister's recent decision to visit the west coast of the United States to discuss business collaboration with large technological companies such as Apple and Google was most likely influenced by official statistics. According to a recent study, California's gross domestic product will soon surpass Germany's, putting it in the fourth place globally behind the United States, China and Japan. Given the importance of official statistics, it should come as no surprise that the ECA decided to carry out a performance audit on the quality of European statistics. But what exactly are European statistics? European statistics refer to official statistical data on the EU member states and EFTA countries. They are produced by two separate statistical systems, the European Statistical System and the European System of Central Banks. Eurostat, the statistical office of the EU, coordinates the European Statistical System by processing data from 31 national statistical offices. The production of European statistics costs around 3 billion euros per year and more than 50,000 statisticians are employed in the EU to make this possible. Now, let's take a closer look at the ECA's audit. Our audit focused on the European statistical system. Our main audit question was whether the European Commission provides effectively for high-quality European statistics. For this purpose, we examined the design and implementation of the European statistical program, the quality of statistics in three different thematic areas – labour, business and health – and the Commission's role in implementing the quality framework of the European Statistics Code of Practice. We concluded that the statistics provided by the Commission are of sufficient quality to benefit policymakers, businesses and citizens. However, we identified some weaknesses and issued five specific recommendations. Our first recommendation concerned better meeting the needs of users. To accomplish this, the Commission should make the Statistical Advisory Committee, a European body that provides the Commission with a perspective of users, more inclusive. The Committee would be more effective if it were a more balanced body representing all users, including academia and civil society. Our second recommendation was to strengthen the financial independence of the European Statistical Programme. To ensure that the programme can operate effectively and innovate, it is important to reduce its reliance on funding from other Commission services and to prioritise innovative projects with a clear EU added value over regular statistical activities. Our third recommendation was to improve the Member States' quality reports and Eurostat's assessment of statistical quality. Improving both these aspects should enable Eurostat to enhance the accuracy, comparability and coherence of the statistics in the three thematic areas we audited. Our fourth recommendation focused on a specific aspect of statistics dissemination. 
pre-release access to statistics is a sensitive issue because it can have an impact on the capital markets. We recommended that the Commission carefully consider the necessity and the added value of granting pre-release access to its services, the European Central Bank and mass media. If it decides to maintain this practice, the Commission should publish comprehensive information and strengthen its safeguards against the risk of leaks. This will help to increase public trust in European statistics and ensure that the data is used in a responsible and ethical manner. Finally, the fifth recommendation concerned the feasibility of strengthening the mandate of the European Statistical Governance Advisory Board. This high-level strategic body currently provides an independent overview of the European statistical system as regards the implementation of the European Statistical Code of Practice. Expanding its mandate would make the peer reviews of the European statistical system more effective. In conclusion, we believe that these five recommendations, if implemented effectively, could enhance confidence in the reliability of the European statistics used by many areas of society. Thank you for your attention. Damien, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for giving me back the floor, dear Thanos, uh, and thank you very much for walking us through your findings and recommendations for the future. Dear viewers, please stay with us. We'll be back in a few moments for the first keynote of the day. And we are back in action. In the next session, we'll be focusing on how we ensure the credibility of official statistics through effective governance, independence and accountability. So these are the three buzzwords that will stay with us at least for another hour or so. Now we have great honour to have with us virtually Professor Enrico Giovannini who will set the scene first. Professor Giovannini hardly needs an introduction in the statistical circles. He is former chair of the European Statistical Governance Advisory Board, a former chief statistician of Italy, and I believe in the country he knows best, he has already served twice as ministers. I'll end here, Mr. Giovannini. It's great to have you with us, Professor. As they say, we are all ears. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon to everybody and thank you for this invitation. And let me send a warm greetings to Mariana Kotseva, with whom I worked uh, for several years. Very well, great cooperation. I was just thinking uh, uh, about my first visit to Luxembourg. It was in 1993 when I was head of national accounts. And since then, uh, in uh, various positions, I saw the incredible development of the European statistical system. And as a former chief statistician at the OECD, I had the opportunity really to appreciate very much how far, vis-à-vis -vis the others, the European statistical system is, notwithstanding some problems, some possibilities for improvement, as usual. But let me start exactly from here, stressing the fact that the European statistical system is, in my view, the best uh, uh, statistical system in the world, which provided itself with clear rules, with a code of conduct, and uh, with a strong leadership by Eurostat, helped our countries to uh, address several challenges over the years. Let me also say that uh, when uh, I was asked by the Secretary General Ban Ki-moon of the UN to uh, prepare the report uh, A World That Counts in 2014 in the preparation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, we draw a lot of lessons from uh, the European system trying to push UN to go in the same direction with some improvements, but of course other parts of the world are not as uh, well developed as the European one. Notwithstanding uh, these uh, great developments, of course, as uh, in your report is uh, stressed, uh, there are possible improvements. But before entering uh, into these opportunities, let me just remind uh, everybody with uh, a formula that years ago I put down in paper 
which didn't help me very much in the relationships with my fellow chief statisticians. Because I tried to calculate the value added of statistics. According to the national accounts rules and the uh, economic activities uh, um, classification, uh, the production of statistics is a public service together with the defense and general services of the provided by the government. Now, according to the national accounts, the value of a service depends on the change that the fruition, the use of that service produces in the consumer. So I ask myself uh, where the value added uh, comes from, from the service of producing official statistics. And there are five elements that make the value added high or low or even negative, uh, given the fact that there are costs for production. First, the quantity of data that are produced times, so it's not a plus, but uh, is a times uh, the role of media in disseminating uh, this data to the entire society, times the relevance for each individual uh, citizens for of those statistics, times the confidence that people have in those data, and finally times the numeracy, which means the capacity of people to transform those numerical information into knowledge, because the value added, the change that the consumption of statistics should produce is about increasing the knowledge. So just looking at these five elements, we can easily draw lessons and especially uh, ideas on how to improve uh, the quality of official statistics in Europe. First of all, the quantity of, of data of course, the quantity of data is huge, and uh, I would like to commend Eurostat also for using uh, new data sources, big data and so on, in order to enlarge the set of indicators. But, comma, but, there are several new fields in which uh, data could and should be provided according to three main domains. The first is sustainability of our development, the second one is inequality, and I'm not just talking about inequality in uh, income or wealth terms. And third is timeliness. A lot can be done here to improve uh, the quantity of data and, of course, also the quality of data. The role of media. Eurostat made a lot of efforts in this respect, and indeed, uh, Eurostat data are quoted very often also on national press. More can be done, of course, but I think uh, that uh, what uh, the European statistical system as a whole is doing is quite remarkable. Third, relevance. Well, this is where I think uh, uh, it could be improved because uh, a lot of uh, presentations are still based on uh, statistical averages while a lot of people are trying to position themselves and companies as well the, to com position themselves towards the averages therefore more use of uh, indicators uh, of inequality of distribution could be done of course, there is a problem of statistical uh, accuracy, but I think that uh, more and more people are focused on these elements and uh, media uh, are looking for explanations of why the data show uh, as they show. The fourth element is confidence. This is particularly important because we have seen in some countries how it's easy for a statistical office to lose confidence by users. Here, I think that the implementation of the code of practice is a great experience, but we know that statistical offices are always at risk of political uh, inappropriate uh, pressures. Of course, Eurostat uh, and the European Union as a whole, as a government in particular, is watching this kind of developments. But uh, we have to recognize that uh, the failure of one particular statistical office would be immediately interpreted as a failure of the system. How can this be improved? 
Well, I've been advocating for many years, now two decades, the need uh, to adopt a model similar to the European system of central banks, which mark much more independence in terms of uh, decision making, uh, not in terms of uh, methodologies, because the European statistical system is independent from this point of view, but more independent uh, budget wise. And the budget is indeed uh, necessary to invest uh, over a medium long term perspective, especially if the system wants to benefit from uh, new data sources, which contrary to what people think are not available on the trees, but big investments have to be done in order to be able to exploit them. Finally, numeracy, numeracy, which is the capacity of people to understand and transform this information into knowledge. These activities has been, uh, for, uh, has been implemented mainly by national statistical societies, but I think uh, that official statistics should pay much more attention on that. Some statistical offices are doing this, but uh, we need really to bring numeracy in all uh, uh, school courses and other training courses. Now, let me just conclude this introduction. I think that I'm close to the end of uh, my time. And I think that uh, there could be a great opportunity uh, with a new commission, with a new re European parliament to reopen, uh, as I said, the institutional framework of the official statistics in Europe. Don't forget uh, that the current uh, definition of the task of European statistics doesn't quote citizens, uh, which was discussed when the Amsterdam Treaty was uh, uh, written down. Of course, the practice is different, but uh, uh, it would be great to have also uh, legal coverage from uh, the uh, main source, which is the treaty. And finally, I think that uh, uh, we need uh, to have a, a statistical system which is uh, more prompt and quick in facing uh, um, uh, measurement, uh, also because uh, of uh, new phenomena, inclu including crises that can emerge. The European statistical system was great in uh, reacting uh, to the pandemic, and I think that Eurostat and the statistical offices have to be really praised for what they have done, ensuring the continuity of data. But as I said, beside the crisis management, there are several fields that require more investments in the long run. And I think uh, that a stronger legal and budget uh, uh, foundations could help a lot the European statistical system to further improve. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Giovannini, for your very precious insights. I think you have given us a lot of food for thought. And if I may pick up just on the two things you've said, uh, I think you've mentioned how to uh, come up with an added value of statistics. Uh, I can reassure you that this is certainly something the European Court of Auditors will not hold against you, as we ourselves are also trying to assess added value of EU action. And uh, another point, since you mentioned that you've been uh, in Luxembourg quite some time ago, you will always be welcome to visit us again at the European Court of Auditors here in Luxembourg, the city that we also share with our friends at the Eurostat, where Mrs. Kotseva is from. Now, we are pleased that Professor Giovannini will stay with us for a while, also in the coming panel uh, that will start in a few moments. So time perhaps to grab a glass of water and we'll be back in a few moments. Welcome back. We are starting our first panel today on the future of governance, independence and accountability in official statistics. I'm welcoming in the studio with me Mrs. Mariana Kotseva, who is Director General of Eurostat. Great to have you here, Mrs. Kotseva. Pleasure for me as well. Hello to my dear colleagues and to Professor Giovannini especially. We know each other for a long time, but it's always good to speak about the future. I could not agree more. Now, joining us virtually will also be Mr. Joachim Stimne, Chief Statistician of Sweden, Mr. Dominik Roskrut, Chief Statistician of Poland, and of course, Professor Giovannini that you all know by now. Now, 
absolutely great to have all of you with us today. We will start with governance first. Now, I'd like to start with a first, perhaps theoretical question even to Mrs. Kotseva. Is there a need for a modern governance framework to ensure that statistical offices remain independent and impartial also in the future? Thank you very much for the great question. Uh, the beauty of official statistics is that you start from the theory, but you have to deal with the real life. You have to measure the life and you have to adjust the way you are doing statistics, developing it, um, producing it, disseminating, cooperating with all the stakeholders, taking uh, care about user demands all the time because the life is changing. In that respect, to answer to your question, governance uh, includes many different uh, elements. Uh, it includes, for example, the position of the statistical office of, of, of Eurostat in the, in the public administration. It concerns the position of director general of the statistical office, the way the director generals are appointed and uh, how they are dismissed. It includes also operational things, uh, how actually priorities are defined, how they are organized in programs, how they are financed. It includes also principles of producing statistics. It includes also how we use the sources, how we access them, how we process them, and how we disseminate and how we protect not to forget uh, statistical confidentiality, the privacy, because this is a very important feature of statistics. So in that respect, as Professor Giovannini said, I think in Europe we could be proud that we have a solid legal framework which aims to define clearly the governance of official statistics in the European Union. But life is changing, and uh, if we could be proud of fundamentals, uh, that we have the principles, we have the, the position of statistical offices, we have the role of director generals, what we need to adjust, and it certainly is a need, is to reflect the new reality, the new reality of digital data sources, the new reality of new technologies, where we face the same issues like anybody who is dealing with artificial intelligence, how to be accountable, how to be transparent, how to be solid. Um, so these uh, are the issues, all just to, to pick up something from uh, uh, Enrico Giovannini's speech, timeliness, the way to be reactive, the way to be responsive, uh, uh, to respond fast, not only in crisis, but uh, to be more innovative, uh, to invest more in innovative projects, which is also in, your, in the Court of Audited Reports. We need to create governance mechanism for that. So the short answer is yes, and that's why this debate is just on time, and we have to look for opportunities to improve the governance. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Kotseva. I take it that now together you and Mr. Giovannini have said that EU is the world leader in statistics and also a force for good. So statistically, we have two out of two uh, 100% uh, agreement, if you will. Now I will go uh, with another question to Mr. Stimne, who's with us virtually, and I'll be a little bit more concrete there. Now, how can the government's uh, structure of official statistics ensure that statistical offices have sufficient resources and capacity to produce high quality statistics? Much for the question, and uh, well, thanks for welcoming me to this panel. I'm very excited about being here. It's a very good question. And to be very concrete, uh, resources are in practice uh, something that is provided by taxpayers. I mean, to a very large extent, at least, we're, we're dependent on the taxpayers. So it means that we're dependent on the taxpayers and the political system in a way uh, that we need to make ourselves relevant uh, to them. And resources are always going to be scarce, so we need to be able to prioritize and we need to be, be uh, thinking hard about prioritization uh, in order to be able to do our work. So in order to achieve this, when it comes to resources, I believe we need to ensure that the governance structure includes several elements. Uh, we need a, a clear and transparent budgetary process. We must have an open dialogue with government. And we also need strong mechanisms for planning and coordinating with other actors. And I'd, I'd like to mention here in this regard, it's very, this is particularly important for official statistics producers other than the NSI, because we have plenty of these as well. 
And many are small units or departments in larger agencies that have to compete for budget with the agency's other tasks. So a clear mandate and obligation to produce official statistics can be a strong support for resources for this. But a clear mandate alone is not enough to ensure that we have the resources we need. They will remain scarce. And we, because I don't think we will ever have enough resources to produce all the statistics the users need. This is where a high level of independence of action for statistical offices is crucial. Because statistical offices must have the freedom to be able to prioritize, uh, not only in terms of where to put our resources to be most effective, but also, and maybe this is even more difficult, in terms of where to discontinue statistics where these do not have sufficient relevance and need. Uh, this is crucial in order to be able to put resources and capacity where they are most effective. This is something that we have been discussing within the ESS in recent years, the need for both positive and negative prioritization. And it is important that these discussions really lead to concrete action to reprioritize if we are to succeed as a whole. And these kinds of discussions need to happen nationally as well. Thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, for these, again, uh, quite a hefty food for thought. Uh, what I take uh, from your uh, presentation is a very clear mandate, but particularly prioritization uh, and uh, the fact or the opinion that scarcity of resources uh, will likely stay with us. Now, I think this is an excellent bridge to the next speaker, Mr. Ross Krut, uh, and I will ask him uh, how can the governance structure of official statistics facilitate effective responsive from statistical offices in the face of emerging data needs and changing user demands? So a focus on the emerging data needs and changing user demands. Mr. Ross Krut? Yes, uh, th thank you very much for, for first for the invitation, but also for the great question. I think I'd like to mention you know, what comes to my mind are five things. The first is we need to promote model management structures. Uh, I'll come to that in a moment. Then the second thing we need to in increase the stakeholders' involvement uh, in order to kind of like facilitate this, you know, incorporation of these emerging user needs. The third thing that comes to my mind is uh, we need to have a mirror engagement engagement of statistics in the process of policy building, not only policy building coming to our premises, but also us coming in advance to the policy building uh, premises, I would say. The fourth thing that I would mention is that we need to sanction the rapid implementation of ad hoc experimental research. I'll come to that as well. And the last thing, uh, I think what is important, we need to more than just recognize changing or emerging user needs, we, we, we must go beyond and do some foresight and really anticipate what's going to come in the future. I, I, think, I think we need to try to do this as well. Uh, in terms of the first thing, you know, I, I, I'll try to be very concise, but, you know, uh, we, we in the field of official statistics, we are very harmonized, like no one else in the public sector administration. Yet, uh, even the peer review exercise shows us that there are still some discrepancies and there are still some, some good practices that can be applied in the other countries. And we should do that. Uh, and, and in terms of the second thing, that participation and stakeholders' involvement, uh, uh, yeah, I think that we need to especially put a lot of attention into deepening and institutionalizing our cooperation with the the most uh, valuable stakeholder that we have, which is a scientific community. And now I would stress that that would allow us to be more effective in, in our endeavor. The third thing, uh, I, I said something about the engagement of the statisticians in the policy building. And what I mean here, we very often discuss the uh, notion of uh, evidence-based policies, but maybe we should also think about it differently, like uh, policy-based evidence, but uh, policy-based evidence. I mean, uh, we need to take a, a part in those discussions at the outset uh, uh, with the policy makers, uh, because we can bring in a lot of experience and, and knowledge about the socioeconomic processes, and also uh, we can uh, protect ourselves, you know, uh, mutually uh, uh, against doing some mistakes. In terms of the fourth thing, I, I would I would I would say that we have proved during the crisis, during the Corona crisis, that we can react very quickly. Now we need we need to have a a better legislation that would 
uh, you know, sanction it somehow because uh, that's very useful that we can do that, but it also brings some of the risks in the long term. And we need to kind of like rethink that and make it explicit in our regulations. And for the last thing, I would say, I would again, would be very ambitious and try to go beyond even the emerging user needs and, and, and really try to put the obligation on ourselves to really do the foresight and think of and anticipate what's going to be important in the future, not only what is going to show up at the moment. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Roskrut. Uh, I think what I take from uh, your presentation uh, is definitely the need to anticipate uh, the need for foresight, the need for engagement with the stakeholders, particularly with the scientific community. I think this is an excellent bridge to uh, the next question to Professor Giovannini. And particularly, uh, I would uh, also like to perhaps single out from Mr. Roskrut's presentation how to turn the tables between evidence-based policy to uh, policy-based evidence, if I heard it correctly. And this may remain the sound bite uh, for uh, one of the sound bites from this uh, first panel. Now, Professor Giovannini, I'd like to ask you, what role should advisory committees uh, or statistical councils play in the governance of official statistics and how can their effectiveness be improved? Often, uh, chief statisticians uh, feel very lonely especially when crises start. Crisis of confidence, uh, attack from governments and so on. And uh, normally, if they are alone, uh, they lose the battle against vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the uh, political authorities. Therefore, scientific committees, but especially statistical councils, which uh, must be very authoritative, very strong, can be indeed a, a very important help, not only in explaining to the society that data are compiled according to the code of practice, for example, but uh, continu continuously support the effort made by statistical uh, offices also to respond to current and future user needs, including uh, therefore the discussion on the budget. We have to recognize that uh, democracy is under stress in several parts of the world. And uh, Europe uh, cannot be completely, let's say, considered uh, isolated from the stress. And uh, we know that uh, in future we will have uh, maybe, this is my personal opinion, more often crisis due to several elements. And uh, it, it would be easy for uh, policymakers, uh, and as you said, I was minister twice, uh, so I saw also the type of uh, pressure that you have on the other side, but I was very lucky also to serve uh, in two large coalition uh, governments. Uh, governments tend uh, to blame statistical offices when the data do not uh, confirm what uh, the narrative coming from uh, politicians uh, uh, say what they say. Now, again, uh, looking at where does the value added of statistics come from based on the formula that I briefly described before, producing data is not enough. Producing data because people don't want to have data, they want to understand what's going on. Therefore, uh, side by side with data, you need uh, analytical product. And to do that, uh, you need a strong uh, scientific committee with you. And also, when data uh, show something that doesn't please the policymakers, someone who stands up and saying, look, this is a serious analysis of serious <coughs> data. Let me just uh, conclude uh, uh, on, on this point. I think that statistical budget is uh, part of uh, the new social contract between governments and citizens in the information age that the Secretary General Antonio Guterres uh, is talking about uh, in his latest report, uh, The Common Future, when he calls uh, for a new social uh, contract. Among other things, in his report, he talks about uh, the need for strong statistics, for example, to go beyond GDP. So, strong statistical councils, 
can really defend statistical offices when crises happen and can improve uh, the confidence of the society in statistical information, official statistical information, and not only, just to conclude, when we revised the law in Italy, we gave uh, to the uh, statistical committee in Italy, which is not very strong, unfortunately, because it doesn't have any resources, for example, from the government, the power also of assessing private statistics. Because a lot of, uh, I would say, uh, weak data come from the private sector, and no one is supervising what they do. Therefore, I think that statistical council should have this kind of broad uh, responsibility for public and private statistics. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Professor Giovannini. I think what uh, we can take from your uh, presentation, from your response, uh, is absolutely the uh, invaluable importance of the statistical committees, uh, advisory uh, committees. Um, and I think this also uh, brings us somehow to the next part of this panel discussion, which will focus on independence. You have said that chief statisticians often feel rather lonely. Uh, so I think that this is a question regarding independence. And while we still have the pleasure of having the company in our studio of our Thanos, uh, Athanasios Kostolidis, the senior auditor involved in our recent report on European statistics, I think I remember that we mentioned the topic of independence also in our report and I was thinking perhaps you could shed some light on that. Yeah. Thank you for asking uh, Damian. As I said before we made a recommendation to strengthen the financial independence of the statistical program. However we also noted that some key recommendations from the previous peer review exercises on enhancing professional independence have not been fully implemented. When we examined the situation at the level of uh, the member states, we found that uh, professional independence is still not always uh, guaranteed, particularly regarding the appointment and dismissal of heads of national statistical offices. Moreover, the dependence of other national statistical authorities is even more uncertain because they are typically part of the ministry. Finally, we noted that the Council has recognized the importance of granting both Eurostat and national statistical offices with sufficient human and financial resources to effectively work with new data sources and digital technologies. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear Thanos, uh, for uh, reminding us of the messages uh, from our report, which, of course, you can find available on our website. Now, uh, we will tackle a next round of questions in this panel. I'll start with Mrs. Kotseva first. Again, a little bit more broad question. And I'd like to ask you, as statistics become more policy relevant, what are the emerging challenges in terms of maintaining the independence of official statistics? And... How can official statistics be protected from political influence, particularly during the, uh, the times of crisis or emergency that we've heard of before? Thank you very much for the very good question. Uh, again, I want to bring some aspects because it's a very rich conversation. Um, as I pointed out in my previous intervention, um, governance and independence as well could include different elements. And uh, despite of the constant strive to improve the professional independence as the Court of Auditors recommended in the concrete um, institutional position of statistical office and the, the role of director generals, as you pointed out, uh, because uh, <coughs> this should be a constant strife because one thing is to establish an excellent law, another thing is to implement the law in practice. And uh, um, we share in the European statistical family, if my colleagues allow me to use this uh, word, that if one is in trouble, the whole system is in trouble because it's a question of trust in official statistics. So the effort should continue in that respect. But what I want to bring today to the discussion is to expand the concept of professional independence. That in order to be independent, we have to demonstrate that we are statistically independent, which means that we have to use the right sources in an objective and independent manner. And we should have access to these sources. Uh, and this access should be transparent, 
because this we are more and more going to rely on privately held data. And how we are accessing this data, how we are interacted with the data holders is also a question of independence. Uh, so this is one aspect which I wanted to bring. Uh, another aspect is the aspect of financial uh, independence, what the court also mentioned in their report, because we have to be equipped with, the, and this is not a question of quantity only, I just wanted to follow what my colleague from uh, Statistics Sweden said. It's a question to find the right mixture of human and financial resources in order to be able to innovate, because this is the way to, to keep our statistical independence. And final point, I think that we have to talk about professional independence. Um, it's, uh, yes, one is the legal thing, institutional thing, procedures, rules, everyday work. Uh, but another thing is that we have to educate society that uh, trust uh, that professional independence is a treasure. It's something what belongs to the society. So if you want a trustworthy data and statistics, you should have a professionally independent statistical system. And the citizen have to be educated in that because they have to consider this as a value and have to invest and to be able to defend it. So in that respect, thank you very much for the event. I think we should do this more uh, often to speak to the world about what professional independence means in practice. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Kotseva. Uh, as uh, you mentioned, the need to talk. I think this conference definitely takes that box. Uh, you've also mentioned the issue of trust. Uh, uh, and uh, this is also something that speaks to us very daily at the European Court of Auditors. Uh, and of course, uh, you mentioned that in order to be independent, you also need to demonstrate uh, your independence. And uh, on this note, I'd like to go to Mr. Stimne and ask him, how can the growing private sector involvement in official statistics, of course, through privately held data that we talked about now, affect independence and what steps can be taken to address this? Well, thank you very much for this question. And it's very related to, to the previous one. And uh, but to begin with, there's just so much data out there. And we just know that we can, can put it to lots of good use if we can only get hold of it on one level, but it's more complicated than such. Uh, still, we really, I think, all, all, all believe that data complement traditional data sources such as administrative uh, registers and surveys uh, can be done by using privately held data. And this is not only desirable, but actually essential for us to be able to fulfill our own mission. And looking at Sweden, right now we are implementing a new innovative and modern production system. And one of the focuses of this is to effectivize economic statistics by focusing on administrative registers and also combining these with other sources where privately held data uh, are included. But of course, when we are taking on board these new and innovative ways of working, we really need to ensure that we don't lose sight of the fundamental principles of the work we do as national statistical institutes, principles such as independence or quality. So in this, I'm echoing what Marianne Kotsua was just saying. This is key if we are to retain the credibility or the brand of European statistics. So in this sense, I would like to say that principles such as our professional independence are one of the main strengths of our position compared to private sector entities, we can be credible, trustworthy and relevant because of this independence. And there are of course risks to integrating data from the private sector in our basic official statistics production. And these are just not just risks to independence, but actually risks to statistics themselves. Can we, for example, be held hostage by the private sector companies when we try to rely too much on their data? that they would require more and more payment for the data, unless this is regulated. And is the risk that these data will disappear one day if they're, they are no, no longer needed for the private company's own purposes, and then we will be left empty-handed. So of course we need to safeguard ourselves against these risks. And this has been the focus of much of the new data-related legislation we're seeing within the EU at the moment. And we are very much looking forward to similar such discussions when uh, we are uh, revising Regulation 253 on European statistics uh, later this year. 
but also over and above the regulatory aspects. I think the key is to engage in dialogue with the actors in the same way that we engage in dialogue with holders of administrative registers, for example. And looking at our experience, when we at one point began working with administrative registers, we didn't always have such dialogue, even with other government agencies. But today, I can say that we have very strong relationships, and these are built on understanding and mutual benefits, memorandum of understanding, data sharing agreements, and such like. And we need to make sure that we develop similar approaches with private actors to ensure we can safeguard access to these data in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr. Stimne. Um, what I take from uh, your uh, response is obviously there is uh, an enormous amount of data out there and uh, what you've said is uh, very interesting. We need to effectivize the use of statistics. And uh, a very interesting question, a uh, thing that will stay with us, is uh, whether we can remain hostage uh, or uh, be held hostage by private companies um, in terms of the data they are holding and uh, we would like to use increasingly so, for example. Uh, and as always, I think dialogue seems to be the best way forward. Uh, so on this note, I would like to ask um, Mr. Ross Crute, how does the financial independence of statistical offices affect the quality and credibility of the statistics they produce? And how can the risks of underfunding be mitigated? And thank you again for the question. It's, it's a fascinating question. I can spend you know, hours talking about it because I'm very, uh, you know, you know, troubled with, 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 with those experiences actually myself. You know, first of all, there are different aspects of independence. And of course, every aspect of independence must be treated with a due care. But yet still, I think financial independence is the key and uh, I used to say everybody have heard it already that you know my independence in its most crucial practical dimension ends where my budget ends you know I cannot do more than I have the money for and that that really limits my 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 capacity a limited budget equals limited coverage limited granularity yeah. limited timeliness uh, relevancy all those quality dimensions at, at the same time. But, but also, I mean, brand, credibility, communication, education, those are also limited. And, and in the long term, they really affect negatively uh, what we can achieve as, a, as statisticians. And so uh, you can take my example, you know, a significant percentage, actually more than 50% of our staff are working at the level of the minimum wage in the national economy. I mean, this minimum wage that is enforced by legal solutions. That's that's a very hard situation that we face at the moment. Only last week we have managed to secure some additional financing, but the needs are so much higher in order to overturn this situation. And um, uh, I can't stop thinking about it uh, uh, in the other way that in the long term, it really exposes me to a huge risks. And the funding of official statistics is invisible in the short term. And I can prove it simply because uh, our office is ranked second in the global ranking at the moment, you know, uh, done by Open Data Watch, which is a fantastic result. You may not see this under financing uh, underneath, and, but uh, in the long term, I, I feel that it will certainly harm my capacity to sustain this high level of position. And I can, I can only assure you that. And of course, what, what can we get in, in exchange for that? Private companies are waiting, but there's no transparency in what they, what they do. There's no public control over what they do. And, and there are new inherent risks for the democracy, democratic society in the long term, in the long term. Uh, the second thing I wanted to say is, um, in terms of mitigating the risks of under uh, funding, you know, the first, the first thing first, ignoring the risk may lead to a catastrophe. That's the first thing. The second thing, I, I will be very simple in what I say, but the, the size of financing should be defined rather rigidly, rigidly as a certain proportion of, I know, budget, GDP, central bank budget, wh whatever other less silly formula. Uh, we can propose many of those, uh, but it should be rigid and proportional. These are the keywords here. The second thing, 
I want to say the formula can be simple, starting from the scope of a research, uh, the labor intensity, uh, and the number of full-time jobs calculated, and then correct remuneration structure imposed. However, it is often the other way around. A budget is given which the office must fit, as in our case, which of course leads to a high efficiency, but is harmful in the long term. And uh, let us remember, of course, another a key aspect here, official statistics uh, have uh, obligations not only at the central level, but at the local level, and those must be financed as well. Central levels very often oversees those issues. And uh, so uh, to finish the thing, I would say that a remuneration distribution should be similar to uh, this present in the central banks or in the uh, courts of auditors, if I can make this comparison here. Uh, another thing that I wanted to stress is, I, I would suggest, um, and was already said by Professor Giovannini, we should consider changing the positioning of official statistics. We call it here in Poland as the constitutional bodies, central bank and a uh, court of audits are constitutional bodies. They, their, their rank is higher than just a ministry, and, and that where the independence is really stemming from. Uh, uh, last but not least, uh, I would like to stress the importance of something that goes beyond our premises, which is general governance structures of the public administration. And uh, we must admit that financial structures should allow for multi-annual planning, but in our case it's not possible because it's not possible for the whole public administration. And uh, here we have to still do a lot in the EU. I mean that there are many systems across the EU of public administrations that are far from reaching the standards of, let's say, new public administration. So, so uh, we are part of a larger body, and those larger bodies need reforms as well. So, uh, I would I would finish with this. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Roskrut. Uh, I found this very forthcoming. It was very broad, but also very concrete uh, about uh, your statistical office. Uh, I think what we can take uh, from your response is that uh, financial independence can end where the budget ends, uh, and that there's a need for rigid and uh, proportional uh, setting of the latter. And uh, you mentioned a formula, so uh, I would not be surprised if some of our viewers reach out to you individually uh, to get some more details on that formula. Uh, now, uh, the last question in this uh, li little bit of the panel uh, goes to Professor Giovannini. And I would like to ask Professor, what is the role of international standards and guidelines in ensuring the independence of official statistics, obviously, and how can that be strengthened? And are any legislative changes required to improve the independence of statistical offices? So at once rather academic, but also concrete question. Well, if you look uh, at the European situation and for international standards, you mean uh, European standards, which are fully uh, coherent uh, with the UN standards, the answer is clearly yes. Having uh, statistical regulations and other statistical definitions uh, written in stones, which means uh, in legislation, indeed helps the uh, st independence of uh, statistical offices. We should uh, remember what uh, it was done in Argentina years ago when the government push, pushed the statistical office to take out of the basket of the consumer price indices, those prices of goods that were raise, rising uh, very quickly uh, using the argument that uh, nobody is going to buy them, therefore why should you include in the CPI? Uh, but uh, without uh, just looking at those uh, uh, extreme situations, I would like uh, to remember that under Thatcher's government, the statistical office of UK was forced uh, to stop uh, data collection on poverty data simply because uh, this was not an objective, a target of the government's policy. Therefore, why should, this was the argument used, why should be public money used to measure something that uh, the government doesn't care? And I could also quote Bush, Reagan on environmental statistics and so on and so forth. What I'm just trying to say is that, uh, as Dominic said, 
indeed uh, independence ends when budget ends. And I fully agree with him that uh, uh, we need to anchor the data, the money for statistical offices to some parameters and several formulas have been uh, proposed. And from this point of view, I, what I would like to see eventually in the June uh, country-specific recommendations issued by the European Commission or the Council at the end of the European semester, something like that. Uh, and uh, I, I'm quoting this because every time we talk about these issues, the European authorities, uh, not only the Commission, says, no, 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 this is uh, a national government's uh, business, we cannot say anything about that. While data show the very large inequality on the way in which statistical offices are financed, even taking into account the share of administrative data, like in Scandinavian countries, which is very high compared to survey data, which uh, are more costly, of course. So this is what uh, I really would like uh, to see, but also, as it was said uh, in the introduction, the other national statistical authorities are equally important. Let me quote uh, a very bad case that happened in Italy a few weeks ago. A new company, has been, public company, has been uh, created uh, in order to manage the data, micro data, about citizens and firms from the statistical office, from the uh, Social Security um, Institute and also on the other public institute uh, on uh, public accidents. Was great, was an attempt to try to um, build a strong capacity of managing microdata, integrated them according to the statistical office's uh, rules. The person who was nominated there without uh, any uh, respect of the European Code of, Contact of, Con uh, of uh, Conduct rules, sorry, uh, resigned just uh, uh, two weeks uh, after the nomination because in one of, of his uh, speeches to the new staff that he was uh, uh, overseeing, quoted explicitly a sentence from Mr. Mussolini who was defending uh, the murder of one of his opponents. This became a big case. He resigned, saying that that was just a provocation. But I'm not just uh, quoting this uh, for the political accident, but simply because he was not no nominated according to the uh, procedure, which is a public one uh, with uh, several checks uh, that uh, must be ensured by the uh, code of conduct, uh, especially for those who are managing microdata, which is the most uh, important treasure of uh, what statistical offices normally manage. So we have to do much more to ensure the independence, not only of statistical offices, but also of the other national authorities in order to be sure that they are run also by people who know exactly uh, all the issues and methodologies and uh, not people who don't know anything about this. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Giovannini, Professor. Uh, again, uh, very good food for thought uh, as previously. Uh, and uh, if I can take uh, maybe just one or two things uh, from your response, I think I would uh, describe what you were mentioning through examples as some sort of a selective statistics, uh, excluding certain things out. Uh, and uh, particularly you mentioned uh, poverty, uh, and I think uh, uh, this also uh, sort of uh, ties in with previous speakers uh, and your previous responses also uh, when you were uh, bringing up the issue of averages uh, versus uh, pointing out inequalities. Uh, via official statistics. Uh, and another interesting question uh, that I also remarked was uh, whether and how uh, financing of uh, statistical offices uh, could be part of the European semester. Uh, so uh, I will leave uh, this uh, 
panel or this part of the panel uh, on this note and we will now touch uh, base on an issue that is again very dear to us at the Court of Auditors and that is the issue of accountability. So I will go again back to my guest uh, friend here in the studio, Mrs. Kotseva, uh, to ask you what are the essential elements of an effective accountability framework for statistical offices? So very straightforward, very broad, but also very concrete. Thank you very much for the good question. I think that we have to include more actively the talk about accountability in a statistical community because this is an essential element to get trust in what we are doing in, in our numbers. Accountability could have indeed different essential elements and could be different types. So we could start with being uh, part of public administration. We could speak about administrative accountability, which, uh, for example, includes uh, all the actions demonstrating uh, how we are using financial um, money of uh, the money of the taxpayers and how we are um, performing as a public administration. Um, this includes annual reports which we are doing, uh, transparency of uh, financial statements, all these uh, elements of administrative accountability. The second aspect is the professional accountability which is really important in our business because we have to demonstrate that we are, our statistics are based on sound methodologies and uh, for that we need to be accountable, we need to be transparent and it will become more and more an issue of, uh, with digital technologies using artificial intelligence, machine learning, different algorithms, we have to be accountable and we have to demonstrate that our statistics are based on solid methodologies. We have to be accountable about the way we are treating the private data, the, 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 the personal data, uh, because one of the assets of the statistical system and our trademark is that we protect statistical confidentiality. And uh, in the growing uh, number of uses of confidential data in our world, we have to, uh, we should not take it for granted that people have to trust us that we treat the data in the proper way. We have to be accountable. We have to show how we are uh, protecting the confidentiality of data. And finally, maybe this is the most exciting part is what I would call democratic accountability, which I think is dear to the court of auditors as well. This is the accountability against the citizens of what we are doing. Uh, and we could, Starting with all our output is public, it's transparent, all the statistics are in different channels and they should be equally accessed by different users going through uh, the accountability to democratic institutions like the parliaments, for example, national and European. I have as Director General of Eurostat uh, an annual statistical dialogue hearing public hearing with the European Parliament where I am there just to answer to questions. But we also have a number of reports um, at European level on certain domains of statistics or so implementation of certain, certain legal acts to the Parliament and to the Council, which also are kind of uh, democratic accountability to show uh, how, what is the value added of European statistics and publicly to show how we are doing our job. So I will stop there. Thank you very much. I'm convinced. Um, if I can just uh, quickly recap, I think I've mentioned four. Uh, you've mentioned four types of accountability. I will just uh, end with the last one: democratic account accountability. I think uh, this is the uh, basis of uh, our work. Also here, uh, we are all accountable to citizens, uh, and uh, citizens are also taxpayers. This is even more so uh, the case. Uh, but I also uh, take your point on the need again to demonstrate uh, the accountability, particularly in the light of the artificial intelligence algorithms, so on and so forth. So uh, my next question will go uh, to Mr. Stimne. What are the emerging challenges in terms of accountability in official statistics and how can they be tackled? Well, thank you very much. Uh, as was, was just mentioned, we need to be accountable to, to citizens and to society. Uh, but we, with society, it's not just a question of citizens, but also all the different actors in society, so that they can in turn fulfill their role in a functioning democracy. 
And so there are several different ways uh, formally in which society as a whole can hold us accountable for the statistics we produce. Uh, processes such as audits and reviews, like the one carried out by the ECA, are one example. But I would also like to say that uh, the more informal platforms we have, such as user groups, conferences, seminars, dialogues, and all the ways in which I and my staff meet users are as important, if not more important, to uh, expose ourselves to accountability. And these are perhaps the more challenging as well. It can be challenging to stand in front, front of a group of experienced users and try to explain changes in the portfolio of official statistics. For example, when methods need to be changed due to developments in society or in user needs, for example, to measure new phenomena, or to overcome challenges like decreased response rates and limited resources, among others. But this is where the true accountability lies. And this is where an open dialogue with users is a game changer. We think this is very important as Statistics Sweden, and we are uh, organizing now uh, shortly a high-level meeting for Director Generals of the NSIs within the ESS in April on exactly this issue. How NSIs need to take on the role of statistical leadership to engage with users and promote public confidence in official statistics. The meeting will aim to uh, provide a forum for inspiration and exchange of experiences when engaging with society in general and institutional users in particular. So we're really looking forward to this opportunity to learn from our fellow MSIs and discuss the issue of accountability further. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think, uh, again, uh, we are at the right place at the right time to discuss this issue of accountability further, uh, and we will be happy to do so even after this uh, conference. Uh, what I perhaps take from your response is the importance uh, to expose ourselves to accountability in general, and particularly also to user groups, seminars, and dialogue. Uh, so, on the next question, I would like to be quite concrete, uh, asking Mr. Roscrut if he could share some best practices with us relating to promoting accountability in the government's official statistics, obviously. I understand my reply has to be very short and quick. Uh, so I'll distill it only to two suggestions, that, but of course there are many more, but that, that's the other topic. If I would be to suggest only two things, the first I would suggest is to in increase the institutionalization of our relationships with the most competent group of stakeholders, which is academia. And uh, I think that there is no other community that com can competently push and evaluate accountability of the official statistics. And uh, I I'll give you my example in our, our country. We have a statistics council, which includes representatives of academia. Then we have a scientific statistics council. Then we have a methodological commission that we have a systematic conferences together. Then we promote simultaneous employment at the university and within our office. Uh, uh, the peer review that came to us uh, has recognized our excellent practices in this area and I think they're very beneficial to us. The second suggestion I would have is to put triple emphasis on international cooperation. Uh, that's nothing new. Uh, no, we have uh, fundamental principles and that's the last of them, the number 10. But, but what I think is that international cooperation is, is beneficial in so many dimensions. Uh, it would be a good topic for a separate conference. Uh, uh, for example, within the European statistical system, we have this unique privilege, really unique privilege of being able to work together very closely and so effectively. And of course, it also gives us a challenge to make even more of, of that. And uh, we're trying to, to, to go this way. Uh, there is a prominent role in the standardization of what and how we do. And it can only improve through increased international cooperation. Uh, I would like to mention also the great importance of uh, all kinds of comparisons that we do and rankings, such as the Odin ranking that I already mentioned. It's, it's a great way to test accountability. Like I enjoy very much seeing that we are ranked very high in terms of the topical coverage of what we do globally. And that's the best measure of accountability that I can get. And uh, I, 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 I will finish like saying that, you know, one of the problems of public administration in general is lack of the market and, and that causes public administration to be less innovative than the, than the you know, uh, commercial world. But international cooperation somehow provide, 
provides us with such a market. We can compare, we can relate, we can see how others are doing, and that's really useful, and we should take advantage of it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Roskut. I think this was a uh, very clear response. Uh, and uh, uh, as we're running slightly behind schedule, I'm just trying to check if uh, Mr. Uh, Giovannini is uh, still with us. I had one last question uh, for him. Professor Giovannini. I'm afraid Professor Giovannini may no longer be with us. Uh, so if uh, that is indeed the case, uh, then I think we can end this panel for the moment. Uh, so thank you to all four uh, panelists uh, for very thought-provoking insights uh, to Mr. Stimle, Mr. Roskrut and Mr. Giovannini virtually and to uh, Mrs. Kotseva live here in the studio. Uh, I think uh, if we were in a physical room, there would definitely be a round of applause at the moment. So, dear viewers, please stay with us uh, for the second panel as we'll be back in a very few moments. And we're back. We had a small change of guard here and we're ready to kick off our second topic of the day. Now we will embark on a voyage from tradition to innovation in official statistics and talk about the future of statistical product development. Now in the first part uh, of this panel uh, it was focused on the EU but the second one will have a more transatlantic and global perspective to it as well. We will hear insights from the US and the IMF. Now we are very privileged to have with us as a keynote speaker Dr. Sally Ann Keller. She is the chief scientist of the US Census Bureau. Dr. Keller is also associate director of the Bureau's research and methodology direct directorate and will tell us how the Bureau plans to envision the development of statistical products on their end. Now Dr. Keller it's absolutely great to have you with us. Apologies uh, for uh, asking you to wait a little bit as we were uh, delayed from the first panel. Uh, I know that you are in a different time zone in the US and we look very much forward to your presentation today. Well, thank you very much and thank you for the invitation to speak. The US Census Bureau has a long history of innovation and what I'd like to do today is share with you our current trajectory. It starts with um, our leadership setting the stage, and this particular quote has uh, several themes that are very familiar from the first panel that we just listened to. And it says that as we advance into the 21st century, we are experienced increased demand for our data. We're struggling with challenges to, tradi to traditional data collection, and we're exploring rich new data sources and tools that can revolutionize what we do and how we do it. Our success depends on our ability to seize the opportunities in front of us and deliver statistical products that address the increasingly complex and diverse needs of our users. So the question is, what does that mean? How do we actually achieve that vision? And what that means is that we really need to think about flipping the focus of our workflow within a, our statistical agencies. We should be determining what information stakeholders need to reach their objectives, and then use that information to shape the statistical products that we need to, de that we need to develop and deliver. We have always thought about the purpose of including specific questions on a survey or census or specific data elements that we collect. But we have not always thought about the more cross-cutting purposes in use our stakeholders need our data to support. Things like migration, climate change, commuting patterns, and even issues around data that need to be able to support grant applications so that we have equity in across the potential recipients of the funding. Well, this is the paradigm shift, is to take a statistical product first approach, not a survey first approach, not an administrative data first approach, 
but to really think about the statistical products that we need to develop and then think about this vast array of data assets that we have available and how do we drive those data assets to inform the statistical product development and to shape the statistics that we develop. We also then are able to use this information to understand gaps that we have in data and information and allow that to drive future data collection. Well, what are all the data assets we're talking about? It's just such an exciting time to be a statistician, to be in the space of official statistics because of the potential data that we have available to us today. We first of all have our design data collection, all of the surveys and censuses and uh, different uh, intentional data collections that we do. But today we're adding to that administrative data. These administrative data are coming from public and private sources. They're coming at us from very local levels of government to national governments to global, to the global stage. And then there's the opportunity data that's out there. The data that sits across the internet of things um, that we're able to access in all different ways and we're getting better and better at that access. And then finally, there's procedural data, which are critically important from an engineer's perspective. That might be algorithms, such as an algorithm that, algorithm that actually uh, drives the street light, or it could be the procedures and the laws that govern what we do. Why this these buckets of data are important to think about is because what we do with the data, how we can use the data is completely related to how the data are born. And I'll say a few more words about that later. Well, putting this all together, we have an ambitious journey ahead of ourselves. It starts with stakeholder engagement, and we heard that in the first panel, how critically important that is, and really eliciting the purposes and uses that our data need to support, then being smart about how we leverage the data assets we already have, identify ga gaps, let that inform new data collection, and then really think about the dissemination and the technologies that we can use today to actually disseminate and bring stakeholders access to the statistics. This is a continuous process and it's one that we'll be leveraging and, and using uh, for years to come. Well, there's good news when it comes to U.S. legislation because we have U.S. legislation some that's been around for a long time that actually directs us to do this, to take this journey, and it protects us while we are on this journey. We have Title 13, which governs the Census Bureau, and it directs us to acquire and use external data records for statistical purposes. Our new Foundations of Evidence Policymaking Act promotes and encourages data sharing across agencies and with the private sector. And then our Confidential Information Protection and Statistical Evidence Act, which again has been with us for some time, sets forth functional separation of statistical versus administrative uses of data. This provides for us the foundation for ethical data stewardship, which at the U.S. Census Bureau and across the U.S. federal statistical system, you know, is an ethos for how we conduct our work. However, while it's exciting that we have all these data assets now available to help support the development of products to, that will support statistical uses and purposes, at the same time, all of this data that surrounds us presents new challenges in terms of how we protect our data, how we ensure that the subjects, the people, the places, the establishments that our data are about are protected. So we need to be embracing, developing, exploiting new methods of disclosure avoidance that can help us balance privacy, the protection of our subjects, with accuracy in the statistics that we produce, 
along with the volume and veracity of information and statistics that we make available. We're in a whole new space when it comes to disclosure avoidance today. We also have untapped opportunity in how we approach dissemination. You know, technology is really helping us here. So historically, traditionally, currently, whichever way you want to think about it, we've sort we have disseminated information on two ends of a spectrum. On the one end, we've used you know, reasonably simple public use products to push out massive amounts of information, tables and, uh, and the like uh, to our stakeholders. On the other end of the spectrum, we've allowed researchers access to our controlled access to our microdata. Well, there's a huge space in between that we need to think about how do we fill. And this space in between can be filled with taking advantage of tiered access approaches. It can embrace and meet our stakeholders where they are with regards to their level of data acumen. And that helps us formulate the types of products that we develop, uh, visualizations that we might develop that really help them understand the insights of information. And then I also want to point out that this whole space of artificial intelligence and ensuring that our data products are AI ready is really important and we cannot underestimate how important that is. We have large language models being developed by Google, Bing, Chat GPT, entrepreneurs in their garage that are out there and just gathering all the information that they can that sits across the internet and around the World Wide Web. We have a responsibility to ensure that our products are getting picked up accurately. So when some user on the web poses a question, what's the population of Washington, D.C., it would be really useful if the information that gets pulled into that query is our data and that the response to that query is actually accurate. It is non-trivial to think about that and it is non-trivial to develop the technology to do that, but it is a journey that we are on and we need to be on it together. Now, none of this happens overnight. And this is a snapshot of the enabling technologies that the U.S. Census Bureau is building to modernize our enterprise. It starts with developing a common data ingest and collection process where all of the data assets that the Bureau brings in, think of that as the front door, all of those data assets are going to go through this particular system. And then we're developing an enterprise data lake. This is a cloud-based data processing, computing, and management enterprise. The amount of compute assets that we need to apply to statistical product development in the base of massive amounts of data continue to grow every day. So we have to have that environment, and that, have, that environment has to continue to evolve. At the U.S. Census Bureau, a very exciting piece of this enterprise is our linked frames, and that's the linking of four key statistical frames. It's a frame about people, our demographic frame. It's a frame about places, our geo frame. It's a frame about all of our establishment and businesses and also jobs. The linking of these four frames will enable an incredible opportunity for the development of new data products. And it also provides an organizing principle for the massive amount of data coming into our lake. And then we have our enterprise dissemination services that, it, that are doing the sorts of things that I just spoke about in the last slide. And then finally, um, I will close with sort of summing it all up. We think of this movement that we're taking and this innovation that we're, uh, that we, this innovation pathway that we're on as the development of a curated data enterprise. And this figure gives you a cartoon of what that looks like. And the choice of the word curated is really important because we need to be curating and disseminating and, dis and disclosing 
everything that's happening in this picture. We need stakeholder engagement. We need that to be driving what our products are that we're developing, what purposes and uses we will support. We have to take advantage um, and really leverage data discovery of the data that we're ingesting or that we need to develop for ingestment, understand the purpose for use. And then around all of this is ensuring the privacy and confidentiality. So this is the journey that we're on. This particular figure helps provide sort of a scaffolding of how we think about our work and is what will help us ensure that there's transparency, repeatability, and reuse of everything we do. And so I hope that you will all be energized to imagine the art of the possible with us and really join us on this journey. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Keller. And uh, thank you very much for mentioning the word journey. I think this is a journey that is not done only in the EU, but across the Atlantic and globe uh, by extension. Now, if I can just take a few points uh, from your presentation, I would, uh, I remembered uh, the idea of flipping the workflow and uh, also of putting uh, the uh, statistical products first approach and uh, in given the myriad new ways of harvesting data also the responsibility uh, for these products to be picked up accurately. Now Dr. Keller if you still have a moment to stay with us uh, given the exponential growth in the volume of data generated every day what challenges do you foresee in implementing this new approach and how does the US Census Bureau uh, tend to address them? Thank you, that's a great question. So first I think we need to remember that what we're talking about is not entirely new. Uh, we have been repurposing measurements to help support the development of statistics and statistical products uh, for a long time, all different kinds of measurements and the use of administrative data. A great example that we have at the US Census Bureau where we have engaged with st stakeholders to define and co-create statistical products is through our longitudinal employer household demographics product suite. Frequently people know this by the LEHD. This combines censuses, surveys, state and federal administrative data into a suite of products that have become so valuable to researchers, to uh, the public, to decision makers across the board. So. I guess what I want to say, there is not a lot of risk, there's challenge, but there's not a lot of risk in, the, in bringing these data assets together to develop these products. But what is risky and challenging that we need to focus on is the sustainability of the data flows that we use. We can't guarantee they're going to be there forever because they're out of our control. We have to you know, really focus on technology modernization or we'll fall behind very quickly. And then, as we heard in the first panel, stakeholder buy-in is critically important. We want to make this statistical product first approach the norm, not the exception. And this is going to take some time. Thank you, Dr. Keller, also to sharing your views uh, on this matter. Now, we are happy that uh, you, I think, will be able to stay with us also for the coming panel debate that will start in a very few moments. So, the audience, please stay with us. That was a very that was a very short break and uh, we're already back we are starting our second panel today to talk about how we can make the move jump or is it perhaps a leap from tradition to innovation in official statistics so i'm welcoming in the studio physically with me mrs christine wirtz director of uh, social statistics at the our friends at eurostat up in kirchberg in luxembourg great to have you here mrs wirtz i'm happy to be here and joining us virtually will also be Mrs. Lily Japek, Senior Scientific Advisor from Statistics Sweden, Mr. Bert Kruse, Chief Statistician, Data Officer and Director at the International Monetary Fund, and of course, Dr. Keller that you know. Now, great to have you all with us. We'll hit the ground running immediately, and uh, I will ask the first question to Mr. Mrs. Wirtz, um, it will be 
on ensuring relevance and adaptability of official statistics. So my question to you is, how can statistical offices ensure that their statistical products are relevant to and useful for the intended audiences? And perhaps a sub-question, if I may, what mechanisms for user feedback and input exist in Europe? Interesting question indeed. So uh, I would like to start then by uh, explaining the setup, the institutional setup. It was already briefly explained in the previous panel, but maybe more, more in detail. So the Union Statistical Program is set up. It's a five yearly program on which is proposed by the Commission, which is then adopted by the Council and the Parliament and implemented to annual programs. To of course, this is a program that it has to be written, so we need to collect uh, user needs. And that we do through hearings. We, uh, use, we ask the policy makers in the Commission policy DGs. Also in the previous panel, Mariana Kotseva already mentioned the hearings with the Parliament and the Council, which she attends. And this is, let's say, the basics of, of how we uh, see the user needs. And then we prepare annual work programs in advance. We start two years before actually it, it starts. So it's a, a quite a heavy machinery. Um, but these data needs are then also discussed with, uh, with the European statistical system, with the national statistical institutes in, in the EU, where we work in expert groups, we discuss with them, we also try to get feedback on the national needs so that the statistical programs and what we produce, uh, statistical products and also the tools we, ha we, we use, like the, what, what uh, Dr. Keller mentioned, the surveys, the products, the administrative data, what, what is needed in the years to come. Uh, we receive feedback on this also via ESAC, it was mentioned earlier as well, and we also have user satisfaction surveys, we ask for feedback on our website, we ask for feedback on multi social media to see how, how well information is perceived and, and what we have to change so to remain relevant. But okay, this is, these are standard uh, processes which, which, are in, which are running regularly or continuously, but we also do more. We also do in the European statistical system, we have started a review of statistical areas. To, because resources are limited, we need to see where we focus. And here uh, we have started a few years ago with a review of climate related uh, statistics. And we are now uh, in the process of uh, looking at health related statistics to see what are the priorities, where should we focus and also where are the data gaps. Another act, a road to see what is really needed, how do we produce the right statistics when we pre prepare new legislation and that's how it works in, in the European context. We do an evaluation to see is a new regulation needed, are new data uh, sets needed and also to do an impact assessment of this. These have we have just uh, concluded for um, statistics on population and housing and the Commission has put forward uh, a proposal for a new regulation to develop the st European statistics for population and housing for the future. So these are just a few elements and I would like to leave it here. Thank you very much, Mrs. Wirtz. Um, I think uh, uh, you've explained very concretely uh, how the whole user feedback uh, makes a full circle. Uh, I would perhaps just like to come back uh, to uh, the European Court of Authorities President's speech uh, right at the beginning of this uh, session uh, where he said uh, that the statistics are not an end in themselves but need to be useful to those who actually use them. Uh, so on this uh, note, I would like to ask a second question to Mrs. Yapek. Uh, what are the implications of changing data needs and user demands for the development of official statistics? And how can official statistics adapt to these changes? Well, thank you. And thank you for inviting me to be part of this panel. Well, I, Tim Holt, a former Director General of Office of National Statistics in UK, said in 2007 that 
users want wider, deeper, better, quicker, and cheaper statistics. And that was true then, and I, I think it's still true, and it's probably going to be true in five, ten years from now as well. Uh, and using uh, new data sources is, of course, one way for us uh, to address some of those challenges. But there is another aspect in terms of user needs that I think will have a tremendous impact uh, on NSIs, and that is the development of AI and the speed <coughs> of the technological development. And for a National Statistical Institute, this will happen in a number of ways, I think. So first of all, in our role as to provide official statistics that can give a relevant picture of the state of the union or the states in the country, uh, covering all different aspects of life, um, such as economy, health, education, environment, agriculture, social life, and so on. Since AI will have an impact on all of those uh, areas, uh, we already know, we already, I mean, it will have a huge impact and we already know and have examples of AI being used in, in those uh, areas. Uh, so, uh, I think our stakeholders, users, will want to know what this impact will look like. And our job is to actually figure out how we can measure the impact of AI in all of those areas. And ideally, we should know this uh, way before it happens <laughs> so that we can have the right indicators to measure and monitor the change, the, all of those changes. So basically, we should have had those indicators yesterday, I think. Um, so secondly, uh, I also think that AI will, uh, will actually have an impact on how users access information. And as sally mentioned earlier, which I really liked, you mentioned that our products needs to be AI ready. Um, I, I think that um, we will have expert users and they will be interested in microdata and tables the way we have produced them. But I think that the public in general, they will use tools like, like uh, sally Ann mentioned earlier, chat GPT. And we, we actually need to make sure that our data is there. And actually last night I was playing around a bit and I asked the chat GPT about um, how middle-aged women vote in Sweden. And then the, the, I got the response, uh, but I didn't think that fit was quite accurate and then I asked some more questions of where the data came from the five most important sources and that Sweden was not one of them <laughs> so I think I think we Salian made a very important uh, point earlier we need to make sure that our data comes up when when people are using those tools um, and then Thirdly, I think AI will change the way we produce official statistics. And we still need to figure out how to best use those new tools in the production of official statistics. Much indeed, uh, Mrs. Yapek. Um, <coughs> what I take from your response is definitely that we need to uh, Brace ourselves for the impact of the AI. Uh, I think you mentioned the need to be AI ready. Perhaps we can go uh, a step further to say that we need to be AI proof. Uh, incidentally, the European Court of Auditors has just launched an audit on artificial intelligence. So uh, stay tuned and watch this space in about a year from now on what we are going to say. Uh, now uh, I will move on.
uh, to our next panelist, uh, Mr. Kruse, uh, to ask uh, him, is the IMF aware of any successful strategies for balancing the need for confidentiality and privacy with the need for transparency in official statistics? Yeah, thank you for, for that question. And um, thank you for inviting for me into this panel. Uh, it's great to be back in the European Statistical Complex as you'll see so many old friends and, and colleagues. And I can confirm what was said in the first panel, also transatlantic scene. Uh, Europe can be proud of statistical system, both the central bank system and the statistical um, NSI system. And it's playing an important role uh, in the rest of the world. So coming to your question, um, transparency is essential because it builds trust. Uh, and without trust, uh, we know where a statistical system. And um, uh, there are many good practices around uh, transparency and methods that we use, uh, processes, uh, quality management, um, revisions, producing revisions is, uh, is extremely important. And um, I think also audits can play a role, like the ECA audit now, um, the peer reviews in Europe on code of practice, um, the EDP data uh, audits. Uh, at the IMF, we have developed something that's called ROSC. Uh, these are data quality assessments, and countries all over the world can just uh, ask us to identify whether they comply with the international statistical standards that also Enrico talked about, the SNA, the BPM, the DFS, uh, and others, and that also builds trust. It's often not possible to publicize the microdata that we use, and that would be the ultimate transparency, of course, showing the microdata. Um, but um, because of, of confidentiality and, and privacy, but um, an important way, and, and Sally Ann uh, touched on that, um, is that we uh, give access to these microdata to users, and that's done in a lot of countries now. Um, and uh, if you do that to researchers in a well-established way, in a controlled way, um, it not only expands the use of the data, but also builds transparency because these users publish data. And that says something about the quality of the data too. When we first established that in Statistics Netherlands, I think 20 years ago or something, um, we were very afraid that it would come up with alternate estimates and it would undermine our credibility. But in the end, it really improved this dialogue and it, it led to correction improves quality. So this is something that, um, well, could balance the need for more transparency and, and, and quality. Um, coming back to the IMF, um, we, we're very much involved in transparency. Um, we developed these, these so-called data dissemination standards, and basically any country in the world participates in that. Uh, this is about uh, macroeconomic data, uh, GDP, inflation, government finance statistics, but also about uh, central bank data and financial information. Um, it's not about the data itself, also transparency on release calendars, um, on metadata, um, basically building on uh, principles of statistics. Um, and what we found out is that uh, many countries are doing that now. Um, and um, when and there's research that when countries publish that data and the metadata transparent way, that actually helps that transparency gives them better access to financial markets, uh, lead to better conditions on financial markets. So transparency uh, really helps. Um, finishing with sharing of data, uh, I mean, we all agree, uh, we just talked about uh, artificial intelligence, I'm really tempted to go into that now, but uh, do that later maybe, um, but, but sharing of data is so essential, we need to share data, we, we cannot just have our own service anymore, it's not enough, um, and in sharing data you need to protect confidentiality and, and privacy. Um, many countries in the world don't have access to administrative data. Uh, at the IMF, we, we have contact with authorities a lot, and we try to um, resolve that and uh, see what we can do. Uh, because, for example, government finance statistics, you need good data by governments to, to be able to make that. Um, but we also recently launched, together with, with Eurostat, uh, the ECB, OECD, UN, and many others, um, the so-called D20 Data Gaps Initiative. Um, this was asked by the uh, Ministries of Finance of the G20 and the central bank governors, and they asked us to work on 15 data gaps. Um, two of them are related in general to data sharing and access to private data. So basically, with a large part of the work, we work together to build on the good practices to, to uh, <coughs> protect confidentiality and privacy and building transparency and making use of the data. And obviously that builds on great work that already has been done in the European context, um, but also in the UN context. Privacy preserving techniques play a large role. I think also in the US, this is getting bigger. So how do you share data while still protecting confidentiality, going from simple measures to, to homomorphic encryption? Um, so in June, there's the 
big global conference in DC. Uh, we really hope to make a push on that, bringing together all the excellent things that are being done. And as the IMF, we're really looking forward to also bringing all the excellent things that are done in Europe to make it um, globally available. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr. Kruse, for sharing your strategies. And if I can take uh, perhaps one thing uh, from your response, it's the need to uh, share data, uh, but uh, at the same time ensuring that, that all the confidentiality and privacy um, requirements are adhered to. And perhaps uh, a sub a point on this is uh, particularly I find interesting when you say that uh, there needs to be access to microdata and that that can actually improve transparency. Now, uh, on this note, I would like to go back to Dr. Keller and uh, ask, uh, uh, compared to survey and administrative data, what are the advantages of using privately held data? And what are the legal and ethical implications of using them for the purposes of official statistics? I know that you've uh, broached this subject already earlier on, but if you could elaborate a little bit more on that. Dr. Keller, I'm afraid we are having an issue with sound. My apologies, I was muted. Perfect. Thank you for the question. Um, and uh, I, so I think what's really important, and this is what the other panelists have already said, is that we need to, to be able to really leverage and, and build on privately held data. It starts with the partnerships. It starts with whose data these are, that we need to be developing trusted partnerships, uh, solid data use agreements, we need to make those as broad as possible, which reduces uh, a lot of the interactions and effort when you're making use of these data. For example, if there is a data source that is going to really be useful for a particular product that I'm developing, likely it's going to be useful for other products. So rather than having to have five data use agreements with that partner, maybe we can have one and we can actually develop it broadly to be able to accommodate the different types of uses that we would like to make. As I mentioned earlier, the Census Bureau is encouraged by Congress and various enabling legislation to seek out more data, to seek out more partners. But once we ingest the data, the private data, for example, for us, it's uh, protected under Title 13. That's the title that uh, the Census Bureau operates under, the same way as we protect our own data. So there's really not a legal or ethical implication for us of, for private data that's different from our public data. It all comes down to really careful, careful work and being extremely transparent about what we do. I want to come back to the privacy and confidentiality for just a second, because the private data that's outside of the Bureau it are a lot of data sources that can be used to compromise the data and the data products that we release. And that's a new frontier for all of us. And so we have to really be thinking hard about how do we embrace the new formal privacy methods, privacy enhancing technologies, all the things that our previous panelists just mentioned to really help us in that space. And the one thing that is subtle, but that has really changed it all up is that historically we have focused on balancing privacy against the accuracy of what we release, use against risk. But today we've learned that that is not enough. The fact that we're pushing out a large volume of statistics adds another dimension into the privacy and confidentiality picture. So now we have a triple trade that we have to focus on, which is privacy, accuracy, and the availability of the statistics. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Keller. So a triangle of privacy, availability, uh, and uh, accuracy of statistics, indeed. Uh, and we're ending the first uh, part of the panel on this note, and we're uh, broaching the second part of this panel, uh, which is going to touch on real-time data and collaboration. So I'm back to Mrs. Wirtz to ask her first question. Uh, what are the implications of the growing demand for real-time data on the development of official statistics 
and how can statistical offices respond to these demands? And perhaps a sub-question, how could international organizations like the EU help national statistical offices in this respect? Well, real-time data is, is a real tough thing for official statistics. As uh, Mrs. Japek said already, we, we, would have, we would need the information yesterday. So um, I think one thing is really we have to be clear about what we can do. Our timeliness of official statistics is, was, is far from real time. So let's move closer to uh, in the timeliness. Let's be clear about what we release when and try to be fast. Uh, maybe we have to be realistic to say real time is not really for official statistics in the sense that it is normally understood. Um, we are working hard inside Europe with the national statistical offices to be fast, to, be, to improve processes, to use uh, new data sources to help us be faster. That, that is one thing. And uh, I think we have, been, we have shown quite some successes in the past, also responding to crisis. I would maybe like to, uh, to mention examples. Um, like we have, I, I mentioned before, we have regulation, we have a, a rigid system on, on how we plan our work. We had a regulation that uh, people receiving temporary protection in the EU, these statistics have to be recorded and provided to Eurostat and then to the users uh, two months after a quarter. Okay, then uh, February 2020, or let's say in March 10, 2020, when Europe had to deal with the mass influx of, of people from Ukraine and uh, we had to provide these uh, statistics. We, Eurostat invited the Statistical Institute to be faster than the regulation and to be also more granular. So, and I think it was really a great success that almost all countries uh, started providing data every month and only one month after the month was over. So, there is this collaboration and uh, I think the, the good thing was also to have many countries in parallel in Europe to provide this data. So, this is this is one aspect and that's something we will also build up on in the future to, to try to be faster where we can be faster. Ex and that goes with accepting that these initial fast data are not of the same precision and say it can be revised later on. But we have to accept this, we have to be clear about what we, what we publish, what we provide and yeah, this is one thing. Another aspect on how we can can react is, um, is something which we try in the European statistical system to work on experimental statistics, to work on now cast so that we um, give information earlier which is not exactly the same that, that the users would ideally have, everybody would like to have in real time. For example, knowing the poverty rate in Europe or income, is income going up and down. And here uh, we started a project several years ago to provide flash, what we call flash estimates. And they are one year earlier than actually the income data. And they give only a direction. Is the income going up? Is it going down? It's not the exact numbers, but this information is very much appreciated by the users. So we have to be realistic of what we can do and try different, different things also going beyond what, what we have in our legislation but cooperating uh, inside the European statistical system. And we support also this work uh, as the Court of Auditors is looking into how we spend money, European money, also in projects, in joint projects and joint efforts in the European statistical system. And I think this is a good example of how we as the uh, kind of inter supranational inter in organization can support this work. Thanks. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Witz. I take it that uh, real-time data uh, presents a challenge. Perhaps it's not yet for the official statistics, but definitely there's a move uh, to make statistics uh, faster and the move towards uh, timeliness. So uh, my next question will go to Mrs. Japek. Um, how can statistical offices collaborate with other stakeholders, such as researchers and businesses, to develop innovative statistical products that meet emerging data needs? 
What is the Swedish Statistical Office's plan for this collaboration in particular? Well, I, well, there are many different ways of cooperating and uh, there are many different stakeholders and users are, of course, key to under, really understand their needs and the gaps that we need to, full, to fill. Uh, but uh, if I were to just pick a few other stakeholders that I think will be crucial for us uh, to have some more cooperation with is researchers in the field of AI and tech companies. Because we really have to understand the power and the potential of these new AI tools and to be part of that development. And we also need to understand the risks with those new, new tools. So I, I would say that's quite critical for us. And then, of course, data holders. And we talked about that uh, already a bit. But we need to have good cooperation with data holders, both in order to get access to the data in whatever form and to understand how the data is generated. The latter is really important from a quality perspective. And if we want to use those data, we really need to know uh, what is the population and what are the measurements. Um, at Stat Sweden, we have corporations uh, with, for example, Örebro University and AI Sweden. And we also work together with data holders. And for instance, we get transaction data um, from big retailers, scanner data. And this corporation is, is an old one. We have used their data to produce consumer price index for over 10 years based on their data. But more recently, we have also worked together with mobile network operators to evaluate mobility data and grid owners in order to get smart data on electricity consumption. And I, our experience is that uh, having a dialogue, uh, at least with the ones that we have uh, cooperated and with so far and explaining what we want to do, that not, has not been a problem so far. They, I mean, we had really great cooperation uh, with, with them. And I also like to mention here uh, a newly established uh, network, the European Innovation Network, uh, chaired by Eurostat, which I and uh, Bad Kröse was uh, actually part of the previous network that we had. But uh, uh, anyway, one of the uh, one of our tasks will actually be to look at other stakeholders outside the European statistical system and to see how we can cooperate and how we could um, gain more knowledge. And we have talked about innovation labs and center of excellence. Uh, I mean, those are just some examples of uh, ways of sharing knowledge and not just between NSIs, but also involving uh, other uh, stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mrs. Japek, for sharing uh, these examples. Uh, and uh, I would like to go uh, over to Mr. Kruse uh, to again talk about the examples and asking him if uh, he could share some of them uh, touching on effective collaboration between statistical offices and academia or the private sector based on the IMF's experience in different countries. Yes, I'm muted now. Yeah, thanks for the for the question. Um, and, and statistical offices cannot work in isolation anymore. Uh, technological developments are going so fast. Additional data sources are coming up. Users have a different different um, experience and require that from us too. Um, so we need to cooperate, and that's what it makes it very exciting. I agree completely with Sally Ann that this is a great time to be a statistician and to do this work now. I already thought so 30 years ago when I started being a statistician and even more. So um, 
going to experiences, um, well, the, the very clear cut one is the one that Lily just mentioned on, on, on Scanner Data. Um, when we introduced it in the Netherlands, um, then, um, well, it was really a win win. Uh, the supermarkets didn't want us to come in the supermarkets anymore. We were walking around with our notebooks and, and they hated us being there. Um, and we gave them back some benchmark information, uh, publicly information, but we did some analysis for them. And for us, it was, um, well, real transaction prices, having the loyalty cards, the real prices paid, but also much more detailed. Um, timing is not so much, but cost, it was much less costly than sending all the interviews to the shop. Um, so, so this is now widespread all over the world, I think, in many countries. And, and this is really an area um, that that is a win-win. And... Um, where, where there's a very effective cooperation that's expanding to, to other sectors as well. So um, oh, let me not forget to say, Lily, if you're looking for stakeholders, the IMF wants to be a stakeholder in that exercise. Um, two recent examples. Um, at the IMF, because you asked for the IMF, we, we established uh, together with uh, World Bank, OECD, UN, not Eurostat yet, but, but uh, in total eight international organizations and partnership with 28 private sector companies. So these are uh, Meta, LinkedIn, Google, Indeed, Mapbox, th that kind of companies. And the basic idea is that staff from international organizations can have access to the private data of these companies. So there have to be international organizations yet. And um, well, this is data about job posting, satellite images, uh, mobility data, and, and we can try to make statistics of that um, basically uh, in the international context. So the, the, uh, at the moment, we're having more than 20 projects uh, using their data. Uh, for example, uh, job postings data from, from Indeed and LinkedIn. We used to uh, assess labor market dynamics after the pandemic. Uh, it's much more actual uh, data. Nightlight data and, and Google Trends data uh, we do use for now casting activity in sub-Saharan Africa. In many of those countries, there's only annual GDP uh, and also with a long delay, while, while it's very important to have very actual information on the state of the economy, and we try to use that data for that. But also um, assess the level of digitalization in countries using data on internet speed connectivity. And presently, we're working together with the uh, UN Refugee Agency to use private sector data to assess the socioeconomic impact of forced displacement, um, which is rising due to conflicts and, and natural disasters. Um, and the second example uh, I want to mention uh, is the area of environmental economic statistics. Uh, I think Christine already mentioned that. Um, uh, this is a huge growing area. Uh, climate change, biodiversity are real threats to, to the world uh, and also to the economy. Um, and so we need to have good information on, on how these things interlink. Uh, and this is an area that the statistical world has, has been invested a lot of efforts in the last 10, 15 years, combining the economy and environment. And this has really been a truly cooperative way, uh, working together with the academic world, with the private sector world, with other government agencies. Um, for example, um, the, uh, the, the academic world helps us in making the right models. So, so how do you do valuation? How do you translate satellite images to, um, to emissions and carbon storage? But also they uh, established uh, the Basque uh, Computer Center for Climate Change. They established an open source platform where there are all kind of AL algorithms and uh, publicly available satellite data that automatically generate these uh, economic environmental accounts. Um, it's an areas platform. So in the DGI initiative that I mentioned before, the Data Gaps Initiative, if a lot of this work will be put forward. Well, Europe is actually very advanced in this. Uh, there's legislation on, on many of the things that we're now developing, uh, emission accounts, energy accounts, uh, but also from green finance and, and uh, the forward-looking risk indicators, things need to be done. And these things cannot be done in isolation. Statistical office have to work together with academics, with private world. And that's actually what uh, makes our world and our life very interesting. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Crusay. I think this was very enthusiastic response. Uh, what I can take uh, from it, perhaps, uh, is uh, also uh, some level of comfort for Professor Giovannini, who previously uh, lamented that uh, statisticians may feel rather lonely. But uh, from what I gather from you, there's a whole lot of dialogue, collaboration, uh, and uh, I think you've also mentioned that it's a great time to be a statistician at this moment in time. Uh, so I'll take 
take these uh, thoughts back to Professor uh, as well. And uh, I move uh, to the last question in this bit of the panel to Dr. Keller. Now, unlike publicly available data sources, privately held data is not subject to the same level of scrutiny and quality control. Now, how can statisticians working on official statistics guarantee the quality of privately held data in all respects? Thank you. That's an interesting question. And I think I would argue that scrutiny and quality control is more a function of how the data are actually born or generated and less about how it is held, whether it's private or public. When we're working with things like administrative data, again, those could be public or private administrative data sources, we have to remember that the data was not generated for the purpose we want to make of it. It was generated to manage an organization or um, other purposes. So as we are going to use this data, we are repurposing it. And that means we really need to pay attention to curate the processes that we use to be transparent, as we've said throughout this panel. We have to recognize that the data sources all have noise in them, and we have to characterize and disseminate what we understand about the uncertainties, the representativeness, and the applicable uses of these data. And again, I don't see that as a private versus public issue. I just see that as doing good science when we're working with data and really understanding where it has come from. Private organizations are really important to be our partners in this because when it comes to their data, they understand where that data has come from and we need to work with them to have them help us understand the nuances in the data sources that we're starting to use. We also have to really think about how do we identify multiple sources of data to corroborate each other as we're using them in building our insights and our findings. And lastly, we need to have our eyes wide open to the fact that some of these data sources are not going to be there in the future. So when we've designed our own data collections, our survey and censuses, these go on for decades, centuries. <laughs> in fact, and we know that that data is going to be there. Maybe the response rates are going to be problematic and we'll have to figure out what to do about that, but we have control over those series. When we're starting to gather data from other sources that we don't control, they may not be there. And so thinking about mitigation strategies for the future of our data series and our statistics becomes really important and non-trivial. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Keller, indeed. So uh, curation, transparency and corroboration, corroboration between different sources uh, is very important. Now we're coming to the uh, last bit of the second panel and we've kept uh, perhaps uh, the best for last. Uh, it's round three and we're going to be uh, touching upon big data and the future of official statistics. So first question again goes to Mrs. Wirtz here with me in the studio. What challenges and opportunities does the increasing availability of big data and other alternative data sources present for official statistics? And how can statistical offices leverage these sources effectively? Okay, again, a very interesting question and touching up on, on many things that have already been said. I think the opportunities are, are manifold. So there is, uh, we could have more statistics from statistical products, to use the words of Dr. Keller, uh, with uh, new data sources, we can have more granularity, we could potentially be faster, but not necessarily. And uh, we could measure phenomena which we cannot measure with, with what we currently have, could also be the case. Um, but I think one, one very important challenge is confidentiality of data. If we get data from data sources which have been designed and collected and produced for other purposes. They, they touch on, on privacy and confidentiality, what we have heard before, and I think their statistical offices are very well placed to deal with, with privacy and, uh, and confidential data 
to ensure that the data of the people and the businesses are dealt with in a, in a safe manner and are used, let's say, for the society, for the citizens as such, but not to compromise uh, anything that, that would be going against the individual person or the individual business. An other angle of big data or new data sources is that we cannot process them with, the, with what we have traditionally, with our traditional infrastructure. So we work on, on setting up infrastructure to set up new tools. And again, here we do that in the statistical, in, in Eurostat, in, together with the member states in the European statistical system. And would again like to, to come with an example. For example, we have set up web scraping so that we can, and, and one of the data sets that we are scraping on the web is, is job vacancies uh, to, uh, to get some insight into, into this area. Uh, but when we started, there was somehow the idea, we produce job vacancy statistics. Well, they are expensive because we get them from businesses. So can we do it? Can we do it differently? But in the end, it's not really possible to replace everything which we have because not every job vacancy is on the web. We can deal with duplications on the web, but we cannot deal with what is not on the web. And so we have to be careful in, in in biases and uh, really use additional information from new data sources complementary to what we have. And um, also Dr. Keller just mentioned it in her last intervention. These data are there, but they may not be there tomorrow. So how do we ensure sustainability or at least predictability? So, and there, when I have worked at one point in, in agricultural statistics and really some countries in Europe have a really great collaboration with administrative data holders and set it up and the experience uh, that, that we heard about there is really to be in a constant dialogue to be sure that the other data holders know that this is reused for statistics, that they tell us if they change something. So this, this constant dialogue collaboration to make sure to keep as much as possible sustainability of these data sources and if not at least know when problems occur so that we can uh, we can react as official statistics and not just look uh, well this happened to us this this cannot be be the way forward yeah so uh, in the end, we need a good balance between the interest of all involved stakeholders, the people about whom we have data, the business on which we have data, and the data holders and the statisticians. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much indeed. I think we're coming back to the recurring theme today, uh, which is a dialogue uh, and uh, also uh, the question of how to guarantee sustainability of data sources, predictability. Um, how could we know yesterday what's going to happen uh, today or tomorrow? Uh, so, speaking of the crystal ball effect, I would like to ask Mrs. Yapek, what will be the future of uh, official statistics? What will it look like? And what are the challenges that statistical offices will need to overcome in order to adapt to the future statistical landscape? Uh, well, in a way, this is a very scary, scary question, especially since you're recording it and you can hold me, <laughs> you can ask me in five years how wrong I was. <laughs> I'm sure I'm going to be wrong in my predictions. But let me actually start by uh, pointing out a couple of things uh, that I think will stay the same within say five, 10 or even longer. And from a quality perspective, um, and I think I touched upon that earlier, representation. I mean, there will still be, we will still like to make inference of different populations like uh, establishments or the total population in a country or something else. And we will still want to know how well we cover that population uh, with the data that we have. And the other part is the measurement. Uh, again, we want to measure 
certain concepts like unemployment. And with the data that we have, we like to know how close or far away is the variable that we have to the actual concept that we're interested in. So no matter what type of data data sources we will use, or no matter what, if we use AI or not, that will still be crucial from a quality perspective. And then, of course, the, the, the issue is how, how to measure this. And this will look different from, from uh, I think, from today. But I, I also think that we will be see, seeing more of blending different data sources new and old data sources and data with or without unique identifiers that we can match. Um, we will still use the sampling theory, but perhaps in another way than we have used it uh, for the last, well, it came in during the 30s, but it took us 30 years, I think, before we adopted it. Um, but it, we, and now we use it to make uh, sample surveys. But I do think we will use it more to evaluate the quality uh, and also for training data that we will need for our models. Um, I, I, I think that uh, we will, in terms of surveys, we will still do surveys but I think that we will design them more efficiently than we do uh, today. For, and, and I think Christine mentioned the, the example with vacancy, uh, job vacancies online. I, I think that's a great example of an area where, okay, we have data, but we, we know that it can't really replace uh, what we have today. But I also think that those new data sources, they, they can probably be used more as auxiliary variables in our current surveys so that we can make, we can do, draw more efficient sample designs and we might not need to carry out, uh, for instance, a job vacancy survey every, every quarter uh, we might actually use the data that we have, and then we could we could do uh, the survey just um, um, just to uh, as a quality check uh, and and to uh, cal calibrate uh, the data. Um, so I think I think um, also in the other steps of, of uh, the statistics production process, we will be more efficient using AI for our data analysis, for writing reports, uh, and also the way we communicate quality. Uh, I mean, we have written those quality reports for many, many years. And if we look back, I mean, we haven't actually changed those that much. But I do think that AI might actually be able to help us here a bit in the way we communicate um, quality and also statistics. Um, so I think I think we, uh, and my last point maybe is, is the developing of IT tools. Um, it seems quite promising with the AI development here. We just had a meeting last week in the Blue Skies Thinking Network, which is an UNEC group, and we all started to talk about ChatGPT and how how are we using it? Are we using it? Are we looking into it? And we decided that we're probably going to organize some kind of workshop soon uh, in this topic, inviting different NSIs to, to talk about the way uh, what we are doing in the, this area. Uh, and I think I think um, um, one of the examples that was mentioned, I think was by Aust Aust Australian Bureau or New Zealand Bureau of Statistics was actually they, they are looking into how they can translate SAS 
program into R and that looked quite promising and it was very quick. <laughs> so hopefully, I mean, we, we all struggle with IT resources and this is a, a real challenge for us, but hopefully uh, some part of that job can be more efficient in, in the future. Uh, but to sum up, I think the main challenges, I mean, we heard some of the challenges mentioned by both sally Ann and, and Christine earlier, but I think the speed of change is really, I, I, I would say that's really our main challenge because it has to do with the skill sets that we need in a National Statistical Institute. Uh, we have the staff that we have, we have to retrain staff, we have to recruit the right staff, so, and, and also just to keep up. So that, I think that's, that's truly a big challenge for us. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Japek, for sharing uh, your crystal ball reading. Uh, we will see you in five years to test your theories again. Uh, uh, but uh, I do take uh, your point that uh, AI is uh, coming and uh, that one needs to be ready. Uh, now, the last question to Mr. Kruse. Now, given the increased competition from new private data producers, which are perceived as more agile and innovative, how can the statistical community strengthen the brand of official statistics over other data? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, I, think, I think there are three points to mention. Um, first, keep our strengths. Second, innovate in partnerships. And three, be in constant interaction with the users. Um, so, so keep our strengths. What are our strengths? We got access legal to confidential information that others do not have. There's some continuity, uh, there's a legal mandate, but there's also the international statistical standards, the very thorough frameworks um, that have brought international agreements. This morning I had a meeting on the new uh, SNA manual, the new balance of payments manual, and this very precise, um, lengthy work. And if we make statistics according to that, there's really um, quality standard, a brand of quality. Um, but that's, that's accuracy and that's consistency, but that's not enough. Um, we should also um, make more detailed data, uh, quicker data, the data that users ask us. Um, so that's why we need these alternative data sources and alternative ways to process data. And some, some things you cannot describe with traditional data. Uh, for the IMF, mobile money is very important. Uh, well, we cannot send a survey um, to all countries in the world and, and it wouldn't work. So, so you need other data tools. You need, need mobile um, provider information for things like that. Crypto assets is also something. Um, so, so to be relevant, to be able to describe the new developments, you also need the new data. Um, and, and it's also about processing. Uh, Christine, we talked about web scraping. Uh, that's also something that, that's really giving good information. Uh, we talk about the outputs. Um, we're also into the large language models and see what it can do. Uh, for example, uh, well, the, the back to the office reports after missions, uh, user interaction, but also data itself. So, so we need to be constantly um, innovating and, and see what we can do and, and work together. Uh, one thing that we will not have is stability. Um, so I, not in the data sources, not in the world around it, it will keep moving fast. Uh, and we need to adjust to, to, to keep relevant. So that's why the innovation is so important. That's so important to innovate together uh, in partnerships like the, the Blue Sky Thinking Network, like the, uh, well, the many UNICE conferences, there are many ways to do that. And, and we need to keep investing that, not only inside our community, but also outside. The last thing I'd like to mention, yeah, we only are relevant if our data are used and have an impact. Um, and it seems like an open door, but it's, it's, it's really important to be constant in interaction with the people who think should use our data and ask, what do you really need? What is really, really your problem? Um, so how can we help uh, in either disseminating the data differently or disaggregating it differently or changing definitions? So really trying to make a difference by interacting with the people who have to make this 
immensely difficult uh, policy decisions. And in COVID times, we, we, we've done that uh, very agile uh, because they need to be hurry. And we all, many countries were able just in his eyes to talk to the authorities and give the information that was needed in a very agile, uh, user interactive way. And we should continue doing that. Um, it's so important not to just make data and say, okay, it can be found, it's great. No, we really have to help the users. And that's in real, sorry to come say the word again, Thanos, dialogue. It's, it's, it's really important, interactive, hackathons um, doing things together so what, what's the answer uh, to your question i think keep our strengths uh, so guard our independence our trustworthiness our um, continuity our legal mandates um, innovate in partnerships in every different way um, and be in constant interaction with the users to ensure we're still doing the things that are needed Oh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kruse. Uh, perhaps by the end of this conversation now, we can also refer to you as Mr. Dialogue almost. I think uh, it came uh, across many times, uh, very rightly so, uh, in your responses. I couldn't agree more. Uh, and uh, what I take from your responses, keep the strength, but, uh, strengths, but also innovate uh, interactively. Now, the last question to Dr. Keller. How do statistical officers collaborate with oversight bodies to communicate change? and the viability of change most effectively to data users, stakeholders and the public. And perhaps a sub-question, will oversight bodies need to similarly adapt? Thank you. And I want to start by saying I think I want to go work for Mr. Dialogue. <laughs> Such great examples across all the panelists, actually. I really appreciate that. So let me start by saying that oversight bodies are familiar with our traditional workflows, and these are traditionally survey production based. They know how to assess the steps in these processes quite well. So we really need to help them learn about this paradigm shift that we're making. Think about it like a change in the production function. We've experienced, I'm sure we've all experienced in our own organizations how our colleagues can be an impediment to change if they're not familiar with how we're trying to modernize or why we're trying to modernize or how they fit into that. The same thing will be true for oversight bodies if we allow that to happen. So we need to help them understand what we're doing. We need to work with them. We need to maintain transparency, openness, willingness to have our researchers, our methodologists, our engineers available to work with them and to help them learn what we're doing. Now, on the question of their transformation, they need to have capable people, people capable of understanding this shift in the workflow, the methodology and technology changes perhaps more deeply than they have in the past. And they definitely need to understand it more deeply than the policymakers and the public because they are part of our ecosystem. They are the translators. So we need to work together on this and really move in this direction together. So thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, again, Dr. Keller, for these uh, final thoughts. And uh, thank you very much indeed to all four panelists. Uh, I think uh, you deserve a big hand virtually. And uh, thank you again for helping us navigate the statistical waters from tradition to navigation. Now, we are nearing the end of today's conference. The purpose of this event was to bring together different views and voices from this fascinating world of statistics. We have indeed heard from some, uh, some very interesting commenters, commentaries that beam the light onto the road that we'll have to walk together uh, in a dialogue, as was mentioned uh, many times during today's uh, presentations and responses. Now, on our end, we at the ECA will, of course, continue to use the EU's official figures on a daily basis, but we will also look behind them to come up with more figures of our own. Now, you will find most recent reports uh, on our website, including on the quality of European statistics, uh, and uh, let me just take this opportunity to thank to all of the speakers today and everyone watching too. I hope you find it useful. We've gone slightly over the schedule, but I think that the quality of our discussions definitely merited a little bit more time for that. A big thank you also to the technical team that you cannot see, 
but who worked tirelessly to get you this conference to you. So uh, my applause to them behind the stage over there. And on this note, let me just wish everyone a very pleasant rest of the afternoon and thank you again for your attention.